kind of during that very difficult sometimes and beautiful coming of age time in our lives and so it's kind of covers a lot of ground over the course of about um, 15 years or so um, and I, I was fortunate enough thank you Norton for um, allowing me to do the cover art as well as the internal art as well so I'm a printmaker up in um, Two Harbors and this was really exciting to do that. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to start with the opening poem. I'll lower this a little bit. <laughs> this is called Real Estate. Cows stare at our red Ford Comet racing by like something ablaze. In the back seat, our little bodies bounce as wheels dip into potholes on the bumpy dirt road. Soon, we are out of the car, running, then climbing a wrought iron gate, leaning into pasture that heaves and falls in gentle slopes, crests into a wall of trees in the east, duck pond and river to the west. The smell of manure is overpowered by a perfume of peonies in full bloom. We tour the big barn and outbuildings, our excitement heightened as each door is inched open, another world revealed. As if in a trance, Dad hands the realtor an earnest money check, a deposit on a new life. The six of us settle back into the car, brace ourselves for another rough ride down the long driveway. But the leaving is slow, serene, smooth, as if there would never again be a reason to hurry. <laughs> Anyone, is it okay if I read the barn? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> My brother's here. Um, some of the, it, there's kind of a time warp throughout the book um, because it alludes back and forth and then later poems will kind of, um, kind of be uh, another reflection of what was already talked about. So, um, the barn. Classic red and white paint, a cupola of crooning pigeons, and mountain of alfalfa bales too long unclimbed. One day, when my brother is grown, he'll swing from the loft in a business suit that will be soiled by bird shit on the rope. <laughs> and that will happen at the auction years before his stroke. Mm. And of course, if anyone's lived on a farm, you know, it's kind of a lonely place to grow up. <laughs> Not a lot of neighbors, they're a ways away. Um, and so this one's called Of Cows. Her name was Molly, the curly-haired Hereford who allowed me to hop on her back as she drank from the trough. We bought a small herd for the farm each of the cows gentle as they pushed slobbering snouts into my palm, extended long tongues to lick fingers. It was the year I turned 10, and for the first time since the move, I found myself surrounded by friends. <laughs> That's the title. <laughs> Special delivery. We have to get the cow on her feet in order to prop the jack-like lever under her rear and pump the handle to activate the torque on the chain that ends around the calf's ankles inside a giant vagina that stretches open like a sideways eye as black rock-like hooves appear on legs that should be the front, but baby is breech. Coming out back legs first, then hips, body and head, breathless, lifeless. Quickly, dad tells me to lift and we heave, drop the infant hard to the ground, rub mucus from its nose, lift again, 
down with a thud as bubbles appear at nostrils and eyes open wide. Um, okay, I might, I might skip a couple that I was planning to do because I have a request for one of the high buttons. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the book, the beginning, there in sections, the beginning is kind of about exploring um, the farm. And this one is a little bit of a longer poem, but the high bun is an interesting um, form that I was um, just telling Connie, it helped bring some poems that weren't really coming together on their own um, together in this new form. So I was able to dance around some different um, different experiences around the same theme. So this one is called River. We drive to the end of the lane in an old Ford truck. There, a gravel pit gapes like a hungry mouth and a charming metal gate ushers us into the farthest corner of pasture where we get our first glimpse of rushing water. Its music wafts over us as we gaze at the zigzag design, artistry of the current that devours the edges, carves the land. Water over rocks, sweet lullabies beckon, a crayfish sleeps. On my new pony, I gallop over the hilly path as if on a roller coaster. At the crossing where cattle hooves have worn away the bank, I tie lady to a tree, remove shoes and socks, step into the cold caress of rapids. My feet are magnified as I open arms to sky and possibility. Afternoon heat, shrill buzzing in high branches, cicadas find mates. On hot summer days, my friends and I ride bareback in bikinis Grime and hair of sweaty horses stuck to inner thighs like bathtub rings. At the river, our steeds plunge agreeably into its swirling eddies. We wrestle each other off our mounts, kick up confused turtles and darting frogs. Exhausted and cool, we rest in the shadow of a giant oak. Our horses shake dry like dogs graze contentedly despite the flies at which they nip and swish wet tails. <laughs> Grandmother Oak casts her cool shadow, a crow in her hair. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the river, new growth stands of oak and birch host squirrels and birds in abundance. It is there I build a teepee fort of long branches a shelter and hideout, a new destination. Beside it, along the bank, wild plums grow in abundance. When at last they are large and succulent, I savor them in small bites. <laughs> Setting sun reddens, heavy on the horizon, a ripe wild plum. Mm. Fighting at home, compels me to distance myself from the house. Alone without my equine companion, I watch the ground pass swiftly under my feet until I stand in the cool rush of the stream, cry, scream. Before long, my hopelessness subsides as if carried away on the current. Watching bubbles float under the fence and out of sight, I am restored. A warbler lands between properties, slight bend of barbed wire. Some days I wander far beyond our land, squeeze between strands of rusty barbs until I'm in unknown territory. Unaware of whose farm I've encroached upon, <laughs> I follow the river, bounce on logs suspended across, catch snakes and tadpoles for fun. I am so far from home that I come to a bridge, a road. It is there I turn around, nervous that someone will see me trespassing. After once again leaving civilization, I eat my sack lunch in the company of someone else's cattle. Cows stare sleepily 
in my direction. Silence, our mutual friend. Autumn arrives and gravity pulls weakened leaves from their trees. Like hundreds of scattered puzzle pieces, they are tossed. Some fall in the river. I watch each lonely leaf float by until it rounds the bend downstream or congregates with others as it sinks, creating clusters that get stuck between rocks. Mosaics of color arranged on the riverbed. Who is the artist? When snow is deep, my mare lifts legs high to clear her knees, then plunges another hoof into the unknown. Bells around her neck jingle as she labors to take me to the crossing where the frozen river holds us both. I clear off a circle, peer down at bubbles suspended in time, at pebbles polished in ice. Beneath a frozen river, within its stillness, an echo is heard. Cool. Yeah, it's been fun working high bun and I, I'm hoping to get back and do do more in that form with the little prose and then the haiku prose haiku. Um, I think it's it's been a good thing for me to work in. Um, I wanna read writing. This one was a poet laureate project um, poem when Ellie Schoenfeld was the um, poet laureate in Duluth. And she had dancers or choreographers for dance select poems that they wanted to choreograph. So this was performed at UMD at Weber Hall um, with a dancer um, dancing it out on stage. This is called Riding. At a gallop, she rides her mirror bareback beside a large field of ripening corn. <laughs> rows flow by her periphery like infinite rows of poetry. She needs nothing more than speed, this oneness with a warm beast, her hair, the horse's tail, lifted in flight, parallel a pack trail on which hooves pound in an anapestic meter. This is the music that dwells in her soul, what it sounds like to be free. The dance was amazing. I, I really thought she looked like a horse. <laughs> that was an honor. That was really that was really fun. That was cool. Um, here's another fun one. Farm Girls of Summer. By June, we throw off our shoes like infants. Want to sense through our feet new grass, warm dirt. We wade through mucky barnyard manure. Warm shit squished between toes, a soothing and soft spa treatment. <laughs> really? When the neighbor boys visit, we throw rotten eggs that hit the barn, stink bombs. Soon those boys will lift our chins, kiss us long in summer's heat, press their bodies to ours in the shadows bare toes touching. So I'll read this one about my, mo my mom and her gardening because I, I've really gotten that um, appreciation for gardening from her in her garden. All spring, summer, fall, you'll find her there, bent over, newly sprouting beans and peas, thinning rows of carrots, rewarding the hardiest plants with space and nutrients. I feel bad for tiny sprigs plucked from the soil, deprived of their chance to prove themselves. Must one be strong to survive or gain strength? in surviving. The results of her diligence are magnificent. Gigantic potatoes, delicious leaf lettuce. 
Our young fingers help weed, water, pick, and peel. Each night, a feast of fresh vegetables accompanies fresh beef or wild meat. Cleaning, cutting, freezing, canning, it goes on for weeks. I've gleaned this joy from her, not the preserving, but the digging, the sinking of fingers into loosened earth, of coaxing seeds into something more than themselves. I, however, have a preference for beauty over sustenance, flowers over food. Um, and of course, some of our food was um, the animals we were raising. This one's called chicken dinner. <laughs> I don't remember how we caught them, but I'm sure it wasn't easy. The way they darted and dodged into holes between bales of hay or corners of the rafters in the barn. Even more difficult when they ran across the open barnyard. Somehow, I stood there holding smooth reptilian legs of a squirming chicken as dad stretched her neck across a wooden block and hacked her head off with an ax. The trick after that was tossing her far enough to avoid being sprayed as her body flapped and ran for what seemed a long time, a fountain of red, the dance of a headless hen. And I have the, um, the art for that section um, is that, I'm going to just show that. <laughs> yes. The chicken with the axe. This is in the Zeitgeist Cafe in Duluth right now and actually um, sold one of these at an art fair the other day. <laughs> the, guy goes, the guy goes, yeah, my sister has a, had this horrible experience of, you know, the chicken with his head off chased her through the woods. Like, how did it know where she was? It was chasing her and didn't fall, like, forever. And then I told him about Mike the Headless Hen. So if you, or I, I think it was a hen or a rooster. It was a rooster. Mike the Headless Chicken stayed alive for months. Like, this is a... Months? Look it up. Mike the Headless, you know this story? I don't remember how long it was, but it, it was a long time. It's out there. You just have to look it up. Okay. Anyway, interesting. The brain stem is down in the neck, so... Crazy. All right. Let's pick um, one or two more here, and I'll wrap up. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of... A lot of wacky stuff that happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to do. This is one more about um, the things we got from. But there's some hunting poems in here too, and this one's about um, mom and dad would always go goose hunting. Um, there's one about them cleaning them too. That's pretty gross. This one's called Goose Grease. And from the goose, grease, cooked into a medicinal lard with menthol added to open a pathway for air. When rubbed on a congested chest, it was soothing gel, miracle cure. Mom tenderly applied the stuff, rubbed it in with farm roughened hands around and below our necks under flannel pajamas. Over it, she placed her good dish towel steaming with hot water heat and dedicated now to healing. And I'll end with one more little horse poem here. Um, the kids were, um, had, had time to, my kids had time to be on the farm for a little while before it was sold. It's now the Sock Rapids Rice High School. Um, the front door is right at our riding arena, I believe. So, um, but this is one about taking my son riding. Horseback for Devon. I lift the bridle to Misty's ears, nervous as she resists, bolts back. You are only six and stand at a safe distance while I comfort her into compliance. Bridle in place, I boost you onto her wide yellow back, lead her to a rock, a makeshift step stool, and reach my leg over in front of you. Soon we are riding toward the creek 
and I tell you to hang on tight when I see a snake. Misty doesn't jolt, but legs stiffen, skin tightens under our weight. We continue on the pasture trail as if I were a kid again and you a friend sitting behind, our legs hugging her bare <coughs> wide back, Misty's warmth and softness. Later on the drive home, I love that our jeans are layered with hair and dirt, that our hands smell of horse long after washing. <laughs> I'll end there. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Thank you, Shelley. What fun. And um, I think we're a well-chosen pair. <laughs> Both of us liking the woods and the, and the country. Thanks all around uh, to uh, Majors and Quinn for having us and for Shelley for agreeing to be my companion, as difficult as that might be. <laughs> to Norton Stillman and John Torn for the wonderful job they did with our books. And I'd like, I'd love to read directly from this book, but I have reached the stage in life where I need 14 ply bold, so I'm <laughs> going for paper sheets. And I gotta tell you, it was a lot of work, typing them all up, you know, and changing faces. It was Norton who suggested a book of new and selected nature poems, which got me in all kinds of trouble, but resulted finally in this book. Mm. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, we well realize that this is not how it was when we were kids, and all you had to do was listen to the radio at home. You know, <laughs> you have many choices, and you chose to come and sit here with us. Thanks a lot. Uh, Henry David Thoreau has a wonderful chapter title in Walden, which has haunted me down through the decades. Where I lived and what I lived for. So simple, so bold, so beautiful. And what a challenge. All right, despite my melancholy nature, <laughs> I lived for joy and wonder. I found them most often in the woods and waters of northern Minnesota, and so I chose to live there. My poems are mostly reenactments re of certain moments. Um, Small doses, I hope, of joy and wonder medicine. Those of us who uh, have a lifelong love affair with the natural world probably got imprinted fairly early on. That certainly was the case for me up in far northwestern Minnesota, not far at all from the Manitoba border. I got left a lot with uh, people on farms. There were giants in the earth in those days, and this is a poem about one of those. She was famous for kindness, Geneva, and yet she could run down a hand and chop off its head just like that. <laughs> Macaroni, I said when I saw the insides. And she crowed like a satisfied rooster. I once watched her husband, the only man I knew who had a mustache, string up and slaughter a cow. I ran to Geneva and buried my face in her lap. Geneva, I said, does it hurt? That old cow, said Geneva, don't worry, she said. You don't feel a thing when you're dead. <laughs> Geneva giggled and taught me to piss in the dark in a thunder jug. 
I was from town and embarrassed. But Geneva enjoyed that noise. She taught me itchweed and outhouse. She spanked me and wiped my ass. She was a good one, Geneva. The world was a joke and everyone said, she's a real card, that Geneva. She had warts and a nose, Geneva, and a twisted smile with teeth. But she also had beautiful daughters. Hey, and fresh faces and breasts, they could cook. The kitchen had pails and everyone drank from the dipper. I can taste the tang of the tin and smell that slop bucket stink and the fragrance of bread on the table. She was always baking, Geneva. She taught me the stars, Geneva. It was night. In the garden, she was giving us something again. Carrots, cucumbers, tomatoes, and such. Everything cool and slick. Chicken shit, said Geneva. That's the secret, she said. My pants were all wet with the dew. Look at that, said Geneva, and showed me the star-spangled sky. It's a coloring book, said Geneva. It's all dot to dot, don't you see? And I saw the sisters, the hunter, the bull and the bear, the dipper from which we all drank. So I thanked the stars for Geneva. All of her muscles and fat, that quick chicken killer, that ugly she of the beautiful daughters and prize-winning hogs, <laughs> that woman of pickles and jam. Geneva, she taught me the mud <coughs> and the stars. And when I am ready to die, she will come with her hatchet in hand and her face like a kerosene lamp and her dress all feathers and blood. Yeah. She was a good one. That's how they talked up there, too. No way. She's a real card, that Geneva, yeah. I've got cran uh, grandkids now, praise the Lord. Kids are crazy, and it is just wonderful to get back there again. Uh -huh. That language acquisition, imaginary friends, the world for them is pretty different from how it is for us. I don't know what happened. Lost some things along the way. I don't think kids are as innocent as we tend to think, you know, as the society <laughs> keeps telling us they are. They do very odd things. Uh, Maxine Kuhlman, uh, one of my favorite American poets, has a poem uh, called uh, A Game of Nettles which is about uh, something that she and two of her girl cousins did was uh, find some nettles, take off their blouses, and rub and whip each other with itchweed, <laughs> and then get dressed and brush their hair and go into dinner and sit at the table with the grown-ups. And did they burn, and did they burn? <laughs> <laughs> the pit. The abandoned pit was our wild west where we galloped on foot and then lit up our stolen cigarettes. Midget Marlboro man. This western landscape came complete with an aspen grove and ponds. The willows grew where we soaked our feet and dozed on soft green fronds. There were buttes and canyons in this world the gravel men had left, where we watched the swallows sail and swirl. They nested in the cliffs. We dared to stare in badger holes to sample the abyss, preparing for our grown-up roles and deeper darknesses. Of all our days at the gravel pit, there's one that haunts me most. When each boy clambered up a butte to strip off all his clothes. These pedestals weren't far apart. We could shout to one another. 
but I felt alone with my thudding heart, like Isaac on his altar. The breeze blew softly over me. The light was woman-warm. I was cradled by some mystery and watched myself grow hard. I've never truly understood. Was it sex? Was it religion? Each boy lay bare on a grassy butte, defenseless under heaven. Pretty odd. Pretty odd. <laughs> well, I was very lucky in living in tiny villages uh, with forts in the woods, running off to our choice of three or four different gravel pits, skating for miles up the river. It's just amazing that we didn't all die. <laughs> Falling in holes, cutting our legs, good grief. But it uh, really tuned me up for the natural world. And I had trouble with this book. Um, I, there's a short essay in the back of my book. I hope you will read it afterward. It's only a couple of pages now. I must have written all 30 pages trying to get at, well, what is nature anyway? And what makes a nature poem? <laughs> Nature's here in the city too, right? Especially in Minneapolis. I lived here for a while, way back when. So reading to a mostly Twin Cities audience, I thought I would read one that was set um, Franklin and Hennepin and uh, Lake of the Isles. I walked six blocks to the park, hoarfrost and fog, and ten below zero, a full twelve inches of snow. No one believes in the mysteries anymore, but still, once or twice every year this will happen, hoarfrost and fog and snow all at once. I don't often uh, notice my breath, but here I am, breathing and breathing. And here is a kid in a scarlet parka, pulling a sled through the sugar bush. He knew all along this would happen. I forget, and yet once, maybe twice a year, we enter this other kingdom. We're here. And here is a woman so black and slender and thin I think of a statue my friend brought back from Liberia. She is waiting around with a camera as if she could capture this hoarfrost and fog that is softer than breath. We smile. She hesitates, then decides she will speak. She says, oh, in my country where I come from, we have many amazing things, but there, there is nothing like this. I would like you if you take my picture. I fiddle with the little black box, back off, watch her smile and say, can you fit all this everything inside the picture? Do you think it will show? I don't know, I tell her, I'll try. My fingers are cold, the shutter is stiff, but it clicks. The fruit tree behind her is heavy with frost. The apples are withered but red. There's fog in the background. The snow is nearly up to her knees. I breathe, and I breathe, and I breathe. Still moved by my old poem. That's kind of pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> And I think one of the reasons that it um, gets to me yet is that I'm sure, quite sure, that the picture we took that day with a crummy little Instamatic is probably gone. But I took a picture, and it's still here. Uh, at the age of 37, I moved to Duluth, and I finally bought a canoe. I should have done whatever was necessary to get one long before that. And 
within 10 years I had wet that canoe in over 300 lakes, desperately searching for the perfect lake, only to discover, you know, in time, there are no perfect lakes, or rather, all are perfect lakes, you just have to be there on the right day. <laughs> in any case, uh, I've seen a lot over the years, and I would say, um, my favorite mammal, of all the possible mammals you can encounter out there, are otters. Mm -hmm. And I have more than one poem for them, but I'll, I'll restrict myself to one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may have noticed that the pit employed rhyme and meter, so does this one, unlike most of my contemporaries, the vast majority of my contemporaries. I have um, seen to it to keep the old traditions alive and see uh, if I can make contemporary language still sing in those forms. This is, for those who are taking notes, iambic hexameter <laughs> couplets. God knows we would have been content with golden fish that day, but the Silver River overflowed with gifts. As we held our glinting walleyes high to gloat and cheer, a chuckling clan of otters suddenly appeared. We hadn't seen their submarine approach. They just were there and interested, exchanging our excited stares, submerging bobbing up right close beside the boat to gawk and peer. These living, breathing periscopes were talkative. They chattered, gurgled, hissed, and churred, so that we whispered first, then laughed at what we heard. Their playfulness and whiskers called up cats, but the otters didn't seem to mind. Their fur was running wet. Some looked alert, concerned, but others just as glad as children in some happy past that none of us had had. Their beach ball buoyancy reminded us of seals. <coughs> like seals, they seemed related, made us feel as if these river silkies could easily turn human, slip their fur, emerge as little men and women. Like us, they loved their water sports. We saw them dive to loop the loop back float, flip flop, dunk, and rise. Their posh pelts glistened, their pelage silver gray as the river. And the rippling overcast that day, I saw that happiness was possible on earth, at least in water. And what I witnessed gradually gave birth to the dream that once upon a time, we all were otters and performed erotic undulations underwater. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> well, we lost a, a fellow lover of canoes, a fellow lover of the natural world last year, and I I have a eulogy for him. This is for my friend Phil Fitzpatrick. His brothers called him the Dean of Friendship. I'm always glad to see him turning up, though you couldn't count on him turning up, which is probably apparent to him. <laughs> the monarch man. There was a man who loved golf and his brothers and hawks and Mark Twain and football and pretending to be Mark Twain <clears throat> and baseball and his daughter and teaching and reading and writing and acting and eco-activism and women who loved him, though he confessed he'd learned through four divorces that he could not give them what they wanted, which was someone other than he was, which was a man who loved canoes and dogs, one old black lab especially, and making jelly from his grapes and giving this to friends and neighbors. And Bob Dylan, not to mention monarchs. That is to say, the butterflies 
large, with orange wings, with black veins, and a black body, plus white spots. This man collected fat green caterpillars, kept and fed them till they turned, you tell me how, to light green chrysalises dotted gold, which hung from plants that he provided. In time, these broke like bird eggs, but not chicks, but butterflies appeared. Yet they were wet, and so they clung to twigs or leaves until they dried, whereupon they flew. Who taught them how? Who knows? But they were off to Mexico. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> One time, one fall before he had a stroke and later died, the monarch man's monarchs broke from their pupae, blossomed, and departed as usual, but for one stubborn chrysalis, one late bloomer hanging on and on like some bud afraid of too much light till finally it popped. Looked fine, right? Splendid as it danced in the terrarium, and yet, the monarch man still worried, fretting to a friend over the phone, he's late. I know the flyway, and I've calculated. His mates are all in Kansas, and the cold is going to catch him. He'll just freeze if I release him here. So I'm going to drive him down there. <laughs> Listen, you got the key. Can you feed and water Cisco, take him for a walk? You know the drill. And so they went. The monarch man and his bright orange and black companion blasting down the interstate, Duluth, Des Moines, and onward, south, southwest. The car packed with essentials, music, one bag for the monarch man, plus greenery, food, and water for the butterfly. They spent one night in a motel. Say, I see you say no pets, but would you permit a butterfly? <laughs> I just have the one. Somewhere east of Wichita, the monarch man saw what seemed orange poppies in a ditch, but he knew better. Pulled a U-turn, braked, wooed his winged passenger onto his finger, carefully stepped out, and offered up as if it were a falcon, his monarch to the sky. Two days to return. The stops for birding now and then. Once home, he held a small impromptu party where he looked a bit bedraggled, but smiled a wide smile of goofy and profound fulfillment, made more pronounced by his mustache. <laughs> the monarch man has gone from us, leaving grief, delight, and wacky stories in his wake, and a multitude of laughing, weeping friends. Among them, several women who, however much they loved him, could not live with him for long. <laughs>
snatched the lines and raised them into useless air. Lake trout have a lunar look. Rising from the dark, they're silver. Yet lifted to the light, they glimmer with a pale green wash. Back at camp, we clubbed the fish and laid them on a slope of moss, knelt, unsheathed our sharpened knives, and instead of praying, maybe, paused, took in the shimmer of their skin like water dappled by the moon, silver water flecked by flakes of snow, but then remembered we were men, so bowed to work and opened one. Its meat looked wonderful and strange, as if that flesh were fruit, blood orange. And when we ate, we ate both sun and moon. A poem for uh, my daughter, who was willing to fish with me, even when she was eight or nine, and there were no fish. I always remembered to bring a book along. Ideal. And my friends from school down on the Iowa border, Bill Brunsvold, my very first reader, I subjected him to many bad poems on the orange school bus to Manly, Iowa. And uh, Diane Seidel, with whom uh, I put on many a Luther League program. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming out, folks. Thank we you. appreciate it. Did you have uh, questions or comments for Shelly or for me? Or want to see us arm wrestle over <laughs> <laughs> poetry issues? I would be bound to lose. <laughs> uh, was, that, was that Lake Trout on Daniel? Uh, no, those Lake Trout were on Ram, oh. which you told me long ago can be good. I recognize the place. Smoked. Yeah. <laughs> Smoked. <laughs> last, uh, last year, it was good. This year, not so good. <laughs> I think that portage gave me uh, an after effect heart event <laughs> two days later. Shelly, I think you are the, the only poet in the world who has written about the pleasure of having squishy cow words. <laughs> <laughs> I have some friends who, um, who related to that poem, and they absolutely did the they did the exact same thing when they were kids. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it really was. I don't know. It was very soothing and satisfying <laughs> somehow. Who are your favorite poets? Oh gosh. Um, well, I, you know, when I, it's kind of funny. I know I'm writing, I probably, I don't think I finished the poem, but when I moved up north to the woods, um, I, I've long gone back to Whitman and Whitman and Whitman and, um, T.S. Eliot and the Four Quartets, and I mean, there's so many. I have um, just a lot of different people I love to read. I'm reading Ocean Bong right now, um, but <laughs> moving up north, I just kept seeing Whitman everywhere. Every other guy <laughs> was with the long beards down to the belly button and the scraggly white hair. I'm like, Holy smokes, and then I have some friends who are real beat poets. I mean, I don't know if you know Patrick Eller. He was one of the Poetry Harbor, you know, starters of that. So there's like, there's some there's wonderful um, poets and writers and people up there too. And yeah, a lot, a lot to inspire us. <laughs> I, uh, in the acknowledgements here, because I'm, 
getting so old and we'll die one of these days. I thought <laughs> this is a time uh, that I've just felt compelled to uh, list the so-called nature poets uh, that I have loved and have been so important to me. In case, you know, somebody liked some of these poems and wasn't too acquainted with other kinds of poetry and wanted to read more, they might go looking some of those people up. And besides, I just wanted to have their name in print in one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, Mary Oliver, obviously, for nature poems, too, I think I was super inspired by her when I wrote my first book, which is more just little, it's a chat book um, by Finishing Line that's that's really more about connection with nature. And this book is more kind of that connection with the land um, in a way that it was the refuge and it was kind of a salvation and um, you know it was a place to connect and feel like you know you belong. Can you guys talk a little about why you choose to write in the forms that you write? Especially you, you talked a little about how it seemed that that form was what helped you. Can you tell us about oh, that form? Oh, the high bun? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I right, I'm going to explain that again really quickly. That was that longer poem that I read. So um, I was reading a lot of Basho and the tra his travel journals, his travel poems, um, and um, I was reading a, a lot of haiku at the time as well. And I had all a pile of poems that just weren't going anywhere on their own. And I decided to kind of work them into kind of the prose part of the high bun, um, and then do the haiku. And it sort of ended up being like this past and then present and past and present tense. If you read the book, it, they go back and forth with that too. Um, but I, I just, I don't know why it really clicked with me. And there's three of those um, forms in my book um, where I just was able to bring it all together and, you know, under one, they have different themes, again, like I said before. And um, it's a fascinating um, form. And I think more people are writing in that now, too. You haven't tried that one? Or are you thinking about it? I, well, I got a book of haiku, but I've never been able to make haibun work for me yet. But I, I really think they work well there, and the, I love the way the haiku puts a button on it. Yeah. Yep, and it, uh, I can always tell when you were there. Mm -hmm. It was a different, you were on a different level or a different space mm -hmm. than with the pros, yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me an example, just one little example of that from what Barbara was just talking about. Oh, the high bun? Yeah. Just one second. Sure, one more, one more little piece. One more little piece. A sunset one again? Or I can do the very, a little bit of the very last poem is um, auction day. It's, it's when, you know, the four of us were there kind of visiting all of our old haunts. Um, I, won't, I won't read the whole thing. I'll read towards the end. Um, we nibble on brats and chips for lunch, grateful for the food vendor parked outside the house. At the lemon yellow laminated booth in the double wide trailer we once called home, we remember meals and baking cookies, cleaning garden beans and strawberries, but mostly hiding beneath it, writing declarations of young love, which someone decides to recite out loud. TH is a hunk. J and D forever. My sister's laughing her head off over there. <laughs> and once again, our memories come alive with times of innocence, painful breakups, and jealousies we hadn't known about before that day. Sanctioned graffiti under the kitchen table. A poet is born. <laughs> <laughs> You guys want to go sell some books? <laughs> okay, thank All you right. again. Thank you guys so much.